I'm hoping that if there's anyone who would like to feedback what you've heard, what you might have found useful, what surprised you, without breaking any confidences, of course. You can either do it by hands up or just pop your name into the chat. Yeah, I mean, it felt like we j literally just started talking. It went really quickly, but it was um, <laughs> good to share a few thoughts. I think it's just a couple of things <coughs> that seem to resonate with our group. Um, a good day, I think, would look like that we have, I guess, some time to to, to stop and to pause between the constant meetings, the constant teams meetings. So I think there's a feeling that that's, yeah, that's just increase certainly compared to kind of you know prior to sort of virtual working it felt like perhaps we had more time in between meetings and conversations to actually do something do some of the work put some of the actions in place yeah. so I think yeah a good day is when it's not back to back and you feel like you've got a bit of time to do something um, I think the other thing that came up was around I guess a good day would be that we have an opportunity for some for some self care, and really, you know, your point around looking after yourself and how important that is. And I think you're right. I don't think we necessarily all do that particularly well, but we recognise the difference it makes when we do have an opportunity to do that. So those are a couple of key things. Thank you, Claire. And actually, you hit um, the nail on the head with the. Um, the gaps in between the meetings, because of course the one thing that we've all lost in some way, shape or form is that reflection time. So whether that be as you kind of go on your commute into a physical workplace, for those who are working remotely, whether it be where you're moving between meetings, even physically within the same building, uh, where you go from one meeting room to another, it gives you just even that couple of minutes to reset yourself reframe your thinking rather than going I've got a meeting that's finished at 10 59 I'm in another one at 11 o'clock and it feels like that kind of constant bouncing between those conversations um that's that's in our gift we put five minute kind of slots into our diary and, and have them protected and tell your team that they're protected now I try this I know it doesn't always work because some of this is about other people's expectations as much as anything um, but it is about those small actions. And if we can do a little bit of it, then that might help um, uh, get to that point. So I would really encourage everyone to either have 50 minute meetings as opposed to hour meetings. And it's amazing how much more productive you end up being if you know the meeting's finishing at a particular time. Stuart. Just picking up on that point, really. So I, I, I made the decision to change jobs in the middle of the pandemic, change organisations. Um, so I've had a foot in both camps, so I was home working permanently and now I'm in the office five days a week. Um, and I think that opportunity for reflection is really important. So something we did in my last role was do not schedule one hour meetings, schedule 45 minute meetings. And that's a really easy way to kind of break up the day. But what I started doing, because I found I wasn't home working, I was sleeping in the office uh, and there was no demarcation. So actually I used to get up and take a 15, 20 minute walk, uh, which would almost simulate my previous commute to work. Mm. And that provided a bit of headspace, maybe go and grab a Starbucks or something. Uh, and just give you that opportunity to think about, right, this is what I've got on for the day. Um, and because I missed just that, that kind of natural break at the, the start of the end of the day. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I love the fact that it's 45 and not 50 minutes, even more productive. Um, uh, I do know somebody who um, at the end of their working day where they're working at home, they actually physically get on their bike and cycle around the block and they use that moment just to decompress and then arrive back exactly where they were 10, 15 minutes beforehand. But then they're ready to be really present with their family, put the fish fingers on, pay attention to whatever else is going on. <laughs> Demarcating work at home is a challenge for a number of us at the moment. Anything else that you heard? OK, what I'm going to suggest is that we just take a quick five minute pause, um, grab yourself a drink, stretch for those of you who might just want to stick your arms in the air and just kind of, you know, uh, get a little bit of uh, stretch from being sat for uh, nearly an hour. 
um, and we'll come back at about 10.50. So you don't need to exit the meeting, just turn your camera and your uh, mic off um, and then come, please come back uh, at about 10.02. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome back. Hi Shana. Just, uh, everyone's got their cameras off so I can't tell if people are back or not. There we go. Hello, hello, hello. 
OK, so we're just going to um, shift the pace a little bit, um, introduce the uh, the kind of toolkit and the provision that's out there um, and really start um, focusing uh, a bit more on our culture. So um, just very quickly uh, wanted to share this. Hopefully you've all got my screen again in front of you. Um, in the toolkit itself, we've got um, a um, handout uh, that's there, which really talks about purpose. Um, so this, using Stuart as an example, if, if you don't mind, um, you obviously had gone through a thought process of thinking that you wanted to do something different and have gone out there and found it and made that job change. Uh, for many of us during this period, um, we've actually reflected on what's important to us um, and what we want to do. And some of us are making those changes in our lives. This tool itself is it, it, it's called Ikigai. It's based on uh, Japanese uh, philosophy of life. Uh, if any of you are into reading, there is a book that goes with it. Um, but well, we've we've developed uh, we, we've used it in the talk as a tool to be able to have conversations about purpose with with colleagues and with teams as well. Um, so it does help with um, framing some of those conversations. So I definitely recommend that you have a quick look at it. And the reason why this is really important is because if we're going to start shifting some of the cultures in our workplaces and start embedding a more compassionate well-being approach, then we need the we need the questions and we need the tools and the frames and the and the and, and the understanding of the how we do that. OK, so for many of us, um, sprints and marathons, um, I, I talk about this quite a lot. Um, I've been running a sprint since this time last year, but I'm running it. Uh, for the length of a marathon and we haven't stopped yet and it's really important to really reflect on the pace and scale of the way that we're working at the moment because anything that we try and do to shift our cultures to change the pace uh, so the approaches of how we're working needs to take into account of the fact that actually we're all really overworked and we're stressed I don't think there's a single person who hasn't got a workload that's beyond what it was this time last year or before pre-pandemic we also need to recognise that not all of our experiences are the same, um, that we all need something slightly different. So to try and be as inclusive and as diverse with your opportunity, with your offers and support as much as possible. So when you are looking at devising um, either approaches or strategies or practical things that you're putting into place, keep in mind the broadest kind of uh, contingent that you have across your workforce and make sure it's inclusive so it doesn't work for the majority. It tries to work for as many people as possible. Um, people under stress, we know, don't respond well. Uh, so we do need to pay attention to that. And I touched on that a little bit earlier on. Um, and the reality is that our work pressures are only going to continue to increase. We know that we've got recruitment challenges. We've got gaps across our workforces. We know that retention is also an issue because people are making either those life choices or we have a retirement profile um, that where people have just hung on that little bit longer to see through the pandemic, but are making different choices or really simply are not wanting to work full time and are trying to look for part time hours. All sorts of different things are having an impact on our workforce. And that means it has an impact on all of us. Um, and all of these things, all of these things are really key considerations of when we start talking about how we shift and change our working cultures. Um, good well-being is where we are at our best, both at home and at work. And I mentioned kind of those blurring lines, but it's really important to recognise that actually if we're going to be able to bring our whole selves into work, we need to take some of that into account. We know what good well-being looks like because there's lots of research. It's all evidence based. Uh, we know that it's where people are valued and recognised. It's nowhere people uh, where people have psychological safety to be able to speak up in the workplace, to be able to feel like they're valued. To have a sense of belonging and camaraderie and being part of a team is incredibly important. We're social creatures. We like to be with other people on the whole. Um, and it's also about permissions. So whether that be role modelling from our leaders to be able to take part in activities or whether whether we foster uh, an environment and a culture of how we support each other and do things like um, I know uh, a great example of where so somebody has got um, a series of mugs for their team, which have got a cup of kindness on there. So they just make a brew ever so often. Um, and, and I shared this with somebody else and they went, well, I can't do that. I'm not working physically at the moment in the same space as my colleagues. So they now schedule in a um, cup of kindness slot in the diary where they just get together on a regular basis. 
that well-being approach really needs to take, I think, three aspects into consideration. Um, the physical aspects we've talked we've talked about, making sure that we're not either sat at our laptops on a regular basis. We are physically, uh, you know, looking after our physical well-being. And our colleagues at um, uh, GM Moving have uh, created an active workplace toolkit, and we'll make sure that we get the the link over to you because um, it's uh, th there is lots of guidance and support out there. So everything from uh, doing, you know, a, a mile a day kind of challenge or uh, what running might look like, what you can do in your home. Um, please do have a look at that. The practical aspects are what makes working places easier. So you'll know what your workplaces are like. Um, I know, for example, that um, at the right at the beginning of lockdown, we had challenges with uh, transport because transport was shutting down. You know, we didn't have the early buses running, but that meant that people couldn't get to work for their 6 a.m. shift. So we worked with Transport for Greater Manchester and ran a bike scheme. So not only are we supporting people to be able to get to work, we're saving them money, but we're also supporting their physical well-being as well. Um, it, the, there might be all sorts of other things that you can put into place in terms of that practical support. Financial advice is something that keeps coming up again and again. So if you don't have that with whatever provision you've got, then please do pay attention. And that psychological care that we've spoken about, so everything from how we work from a preventative approach um, and knowing what, that we've got the interventions when we need it. Uh, we are going to see people who have got uh, low level um, uh, PTS um, that do need some trauma response uh, support. Um, so paying, paying attention to what's going on around you is really important and making sure that uh, as an organisation you have that provision in place. So where do we go from here? This is the really important stuff. We're all on this journey together. I've gathered some thoughts about what we could do and how we can collectively, hopefully, as a Greater Manchester kind of approach, really start looking at um, how we can go on this journey together and learn from each other. So there is a recent uh, report from Deloitte that um, has done a study of public service workers across the US and the UK. It found that 94% of workers were reporting feeling stressed at work, with a third of them saying that actually this was at unsustainable levels. For those of you who work in the NHS, we've just had an NHS staff survey, so we've got lots and lots of data that's coming out of there. Um, and there is some work being done about what that might look like from a Greater Manchester perspective, specifically around mental health as well. Um, it's, it was also found that actually the workplace is by far the most impactful uh, 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 factor on what makes a good work experience. And I'll say that again, the workplace, the experience that people have from a cultural perspective has a bigger impact on people's experience of what the workplace looks like over how much you get paid, the brand association, so you can tell some of this is American, um, or the experience and that's a really, really important thing. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be the biggest, the best, the, 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 the most impactful. If your workplace culture creates a positive environment, that means that you are more likely to retain the people that you work with. You are more likely to be more productive in the longer term. And you are more likely to create an environment that supports the people in your workforce. So there are lots of things that we can do. I would suggest where you've got strategies, policies, approaches, keep them clear, clear, keep them jargon free, keep them simple. And ideally don't have them more than two pages. I know, um, you know, as organisations, we have the love of having uh, processes and procedures that go for page after page after page. It's not accessible for everyone across the organisation. The idea would be that you can pick something up and it doesn't matter where you are in the organisation, you should be able to access it. Do you focus on that physical, that practical, that psychological approach? and really kind of design the support that you're putting into place in a way that it really helps grow people and support people to be their best. And being your best might be different for different people. So you need to go out and talk to people as well. Um, just ask the question, what would help you? And I promise you, you will get the richest data ever. And you, the, almost your plan will emerge from the responses that you get. So we do need to pay attention to these uh, to some of these things. I've, I've kind of listed them and um, we've got we've got some things that we can look at in a moment. Um, so absolutely clear. What is our purpose? What is it that we're trying to do when we're talking about well-being in our organisations? Um, I very simply and I do talk about it a lot. We're trying to help people work at their best, whatever that best looks like in whatever role that you're in. We need to have good, clear leadership that um, indicates and supports uh, and champions uh, well-being across the organisation and then we need the cultures that actually um, put that into practice. 
So it's great if you've got a chief exec or you've got a senior leadership team who are saying good leadership, good well-being is really important to us. But actually, if the expectation is that we're still going to be answering emails for 12 hours a day um, and it's not necessarily kind of embedded in the practice, then you haven't got congruence across what's being said and what's being put into place. So we can challenge that and we can challenge that in a positive way. Good conversations, a uh, big fan of how we have conversations. For those of you who might be uh, working alongside of our OD uh, practitioners or who are coaches, you will know the power of a good, good con conversation. There is some resource that's being developed at the moment, and I'll talk about that at the moment, um, which we're hoping is going to be available uh, to everyone about how to have good conversations. We've got an early version of that in the wellbeing toolkit. Um, the base is based on coaching practice, so it's tried and tested, um, but there are good well-being conversations that managers or, or peers can kind of ask colleagues. So please do have a look at that. How we learn and how we um, develop people. So we, we're all in roles that we are sat in and we know our roles, but actually we all want to progress and we all want to develop. So making sure that we invest in that is also a really key and critical part of having a good well-being culture as well. And alongside that, uh, we have conversations about uh, performance, reward and recognition. So I know, for example, a number of organisations uh, this year are having reward and recognition events or people have been doing things in their organisations. And it might be just as simple as a packet of love hearts and a certificate that a peer has just um, nominated somebody to recognise that somebody has done something extraordinary. So it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be um, expensive either. It can be just the recognition that somebody else sees the effort that you're putting in. And actually encouraging that across your organisation is good. It's good because it means that you're fostering a great environment for people to work in. And of course, I've mentioned staff surveys, but those people analytics are really important, how you engage your staff, how you're transparent with those conversations that you have. Um, so not only going out and asking those questions, making sure that you're working with the broadest breadth of the people within the organisation, then you remember to tell them what you found as well. So many of us have run staff surveys and then we get the data and then we go off and do the work, but we forget to tell the people that we ask questions in the first place. This is what we heard and these are the things that we're trying to do. So please do remember that. Um, and moving from the art of the possible, if the last year has taught us anything, is that our, our conversations should shift from could we to how do we? Um, and we've seen that kind of in abundance over the last 12 months and so making sure that we use some of that energy and embed that art of the possible into some of the practice that we've got. OK, so um, the, uh, um, hopefully, you know, uh, a lady called Helen Bevan. She works for NHS Horizons. She's been working with I think he's Danish, uh, a chap called Goran Herricks, um, who and they're developing a series of um, infographs and papers that actually look at this culture shift that we're talking about at the moment. Um, the link will be in the slides, so you'll be able to kind of get access to this. There is um, a, 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 an article that goes behind this as well. Um, I think this is a really useful way on a page to actually look at those challenges that I've just described in that list form. Um, she calls it seven simple rules for leaders. So this is about those cultural shifts and those cultural challenges that we really need to take on board. And if you look at it, it's divine, defining our shared purpose. How do we ask what our shared purpose is and how do we define that? Uh, rooting our transformation in the sense of belonging, um, predicting and preventing, so starting things earlier on and making sure that you take everyone on the journey, supporting people to build their own agency power. So we were talking about um, giving people the ability to be able to step up, uh, to learn, to expand, to be their best. Embracing contradictions and tensions really important, unleashing learning and the action of small scale changes within large scale frames. So we do have those policies, those strategies. How do they translate to the people that you're trying to affect change on? OK, so there's something around the social contract for well-being. Recent trends are suggesting that well-being and belonging are the most important factors to a positive work workplace. That sense of belonging is really important, and I'm emphasising this again and again, I know, um, but it is really critical in the amount of conversations where um, we do a lot of intervention work with people, support work. We forget that actually just it's just simple stuff. We don't have to have expensive support mechanisms out there. It's just about how we foster those great environments. Um, engage those around you and being able to help support people to make a positive contribution. Again, incredibly important. Sorry, wrong way. 
And there are three attributes of a wellbeing organisation. And again, there's emerging kind of evidence to support this as, as our focus on what good wellbeing looks like is shifting. So having clear purpose, uh, we've talked about that a couple of times, embedding those clear intentions and making sure that they mirror in those everyday actions that everyone can see and feel. Um, really responding to the potential. So investing in the ability to learn and evolve collectively, um, to be able to be creative in terms of that solution finding, responding to challenges and actually supporting people to navigate through uncertainty rather than just kind of scurrying over it and making sure that we focus on the task is making sure that we acknowledge that we are st we still have a very uncertain uh, landscape that we're all working on and for many of us within a smaller financial envelope as well so those challenges are going to be quite interesting and that perspective is really important as well encouraging and embracing people to actually be very future focused thinking and thinking about not only where we've been where we are at the moment but where we where we want to be what happens when our elected services stand up what happens when what happens when and really thinking about the fact that everyone might need something different so again that inclusion aspect of all of this is incredibly important I mentioned good conversations very briefly. Um, you kind of see uh, we've, we have got a, a document that's being developed at the moment and hopefully that will be out with you soon. Um, and there is an early version of that, like I mentioned, in the toolkit. So do you have a quick look at that? But really clearly, uh, good conversations are about being focused on the individual um, more often than not managers or anyone uh, a, a senior who you might be having a conversation with are intent on pushing information out, but not necessarily having a two way conversation. So there's some good practice there supporting individuals to develop and making sure you have that two-way conversation and that having having a good conversation with someone isn't a one-off scenario that you do do it on a regular basis and you do build in some regularity to that so um, hopefully the document will give some guidance around that. Um, are you hyper connected? I love this. There's, a, there's an article, I think it's from uh, Harvard Business Review, about the fact that we've got lots and lots of great tools out there um, that are connecting us virtually, etc. But actually, we do need to question how useful those tools are um, and uh, what kind of impact are they having on us? Um, so look at your organisation, how you're communicating with each other. Um, are you using multiple things? Is it keeping you switched on all the time um, are you plugged in so I know for a lot of people you might have a laptop but you might also have a phone and your phone's just kind of ping ping pinging um, in in the background well that means psychologically you might not be thinking about work but you're actually still hearing the pings and you're not able to switch off and actually get that rest that you need it's really important and the reason why it's also important is because actually the decisions that we make today about the technology that's around us will still be uh, impacting on us for the future. So we do need to pay attention to the why we use the technology that we do. Uh, there is a healthier leadership framework. So this was developed um, with our colleagues at uh, Healthy Wellbeing Inspiration and the Northwest Leadership Academy. It's a really helpful framework. So please do have a look at it. I'm hoping Freya is going to pop the link into the chat. Um, and it really recognises the importance of good leadership and good management on employee well-being. There is a behavioural framework that they've developed. Um, it's almost working like a bit of a, a, a self-diagnostic tool. You can kind of go through it and get a little bit of a sense of kind of where are we up to in some of the uh, in some of our development. Um, and uh, there are lots of conversations about kind of the, the copy and the activities that could occupy some of this. So I would suggest actually it's a really great way of kind of using it as a little bit of a barometer um, and then being able to um, get a sense of where your challenges might be as an organisation. Um, so you might have some things that are actually working incredibly well and other things that you might need to pay a little bit more attention to. The, tool, the, the framework itself focuses on three areas. Um, I see that there is, they have got like a one pager, but there's so much text on it. I didn't want to pop it in here, um, but do have a look at the link. Um, how am I? So that, that concept of being, uh, what do you do? So the concept of doing and what we do together. So the enabling factors that exist within an organisation or within an organisational frame. And making that change is incredibly important. So tackling well-being isn't a simple task. If it was, we'd have done it by now already. And it, it genuinely isn't. We've got a legacy um, where we have a very responsive approach to what well-being looks like in our organisations. 
So we wait, historically, we've waited till something goes wrong. And then we send people to occupational health. And if they go to occupational health three times, then our colleagues in uh, human relations, HR might send them a letter because actually then they have to go down some sort of process or, you know, whatever it might be. So it tends to be seen and regarded as a bit of a punitive approach. And what we ideally want to do is start thinking about actually how do we make this a preventative approach? And we can do that by being very conscious about how we support people to stay well in the first place. But then knowing that we can step change some of that support rather than waiting till people are falling down and then putting some interventions in place that actually at a point where perhaps somebody isn't in a great place. So a really key thing um, I would always suggest, for example, and I've mentioned letters, is if you're ever sending any correspondence out to your colleagues, for, for those who don't work shifts, by the way, so I'm mindful of a little bit of, little bit of a nine to five frame, don't send a letter on a Friday afternoon. It's great when it gets ticked off your to-do list, but actually the person who receives it can't do anything all weekend. And if it's, especially if it's um, information that might be um, a little bit negative or uh, that might require some sort of response, they're not able to do anything for it, uh, for it. So actually be considerate about the how you're communicating with people. And that goes for emails as well. And I've done that as much as anything. I have a to-do list. I want to get everything done so I'm free for the weekend. But actually consider how that might be received by others. So it's just a really practical thing that I try and put into place. Um, the evolution of our well-being in the workplace does need to look at the three aspects I talk about a lot. That physical, that practical, that psychological um, I suspect that all of us are good at one or two of those, perhaps, um, but the three triangulated together, making sure that we're taking a really inclusive approach, making sure that we're taking uh, our leadership behaviours and um, translating the what's being said on the walls, on our statements, on our policies, into action, into day-to-day -day action is really important. And when we're having those conversations about how we're returning to work, place, whatever that might look like, um, we have an opportunity to reset some of this as well. Um, so for those of us who have been working remotely um, during this period um, and then are moving into that workplace, actually, what does our workplace look like? What is the purpose of how we come together? Uh, for some people, actually coming to work is, is and sitting at a desk and working is good because it helps them with those social connections. And I've particularly been considering our colleagues who might be living on their own and actually don't have family who live nearby. So they've not been able to make, keep those connections going. Um, and actually work is a part of their social connection that they have with um, as, as part of their daily life. And I mentioned, you know, we, we are social beings. So actually, we, we do like those connections all the way through to if you've been con consistently working uh, on the front line or on a ward or in a care home, whatever that might look like. Um, how can we start setting some of that um, practice into place? So I've been doing some work with some of our care home colleagues recently, and it's and it's fascinating the journey that we've been able to take them on from what well, we can't because we've got X, Y and Z doing all the time, uh, needing to be done all the time. Our schedules are really tight. We've got shift workers, et cetera, et cetera, through to really small actions that have made a difference. How you hand over between a shift, um, how you can um, demonstrate that um, actually people are being considered. So, yes, things might be tough. Yes, we're having to deal with bereavement on a regular basis in this particular instance, but actually we can do that in a really supportive way. And then when individuals need things, we can step in. And hopefully with some of those kind of critical things, you'll be able to uh, put some good practice into place um, and make those small incremental shifts because none of this is going to change overnight. So I have a call to action for you. Um, my call to action is, please think about what you need to move your workplace forward um, are you clear about what it is that you're actually wanting to achieve? Um, what do you already have? Uh, what do you need to put into place? How can you move this forward with your execs and your teams? Where are you going to be able to use your influence as individuals? Every single one of you who's turned up to this summit session this, today are here because you're interested in this work. You're interested in understanding how you can start making some of those shifts. And I would suggest that every single one of you have the power to influence the people that you work with to understand better and make better decisions about what that workplace culture might look like. So do it. Don't apologise for wanting to have that conversation with somebody and go and go and figure out who you need to influence it and put that into place. And if you're the person who is able to put those um, things into place, then ask other people what's most helpful and base it on data rather than assumptions.
And finally, I would challenge each and every one of you to think about from this session, what's the one thing that you're going to take? What, what's the one thing that's resonated with you today that you've heard that you're going to take into your workplace? And let us know because it's really helpful to understand what people are putting into practice. So you've got our email address. Um, if you've got something that you're either struggling with and want a little bit of support or intervention, or if you've got if you've tried something and it's worked really well, either way, we really want to hear what you're putting into place because collectively, uh, what's really helpful is that we can start sharing some of our practice across our footprints, our neighbourhoods, our localities, and help all of us get uh, better at what we do across our what will be our ICS footprint as we move forward. Um, and finally, where you can get more support. I've already touched on some of this. You have the toolkit. You have the Greater Manchester Wellbeing Toolkit. We've purposely made this copyright free, so please use it in a way that's helpful for you. If you haven't got anything in place and you want to use it as it is, you're more than welcome to. If you've already got provision in your organisation and you just want to borrow or remix whatever language you might use and embed some of the practices into what you've already got, you're able to do that as well. Um, uh, and that's exactly what it's there for. Share it with your colleagues, put it into your internal newsletters, whatever's helpful. If you've got an internet, put it up to an internet example. Um, learn from each other as well. For each of you, ask those questions, figure out where your colleagues are and where your advocates are for, for developing some of those cultural shifts that we've been talking about. If you've got an OD team in your organisation, you have access to people who can support that, um, go and ask them. Our OD, I, I'm an OD practitioner. Um, I, work, I work with a number of organisations across Greater Manchester. You, All of you have phenomenal access to people. It's just perhaps making sure that it's all connecting up, especially in those larger organisations as well. You might be just up the corridor from somebody who might have the thing that's going to help you. So do make sure you connect with your OD colleagues. And my final thing that I would suggest is please make sure whatever you do, you keep it simple, that um, you keep it accessible and you keep it as inclusive as possible. And those small actions, I promise you, will accumulate into those big cultural shifts and changes. Uh, we've got a few minutes before I hand over to Freya. Has anyone got any questions? I'll just then move this slide over. Or any reflections or any thoughts that you want to share? I've stunned everyone into silence. There will be an opportunity in this next part when we go on to Menti for people to share things if they prefer to do it that way. Well, I just want to say thank you for bringing all these resources into one place and linking to the leadership framework and things like that. I think it's going to be really useful to dip in and out of because we're, we're like our trust is also doing that stuff. Um, but it's there's only like so many things that that individual can fall together to send out. So I think just constantly sense checking where people are up to and a different approach to maybe the same like conversation is always is always worth having a look through. So thank you. Just yeah, just to echo that really uh Shani Freya, because we we you know we've put loads of resource I'm from Traffic Council, lots of resources on the internet, but I think that can be overwhelming. And what I love about the toolkit, it's just so accessible, it's really well designed, the information's great and I think it'll support busy managers to quickly access the information they need and, and then therefore build their confidence in having those discussions. So yeah, a yeah. really good tool. Yeah, thank you. And the one thing that we heard really clearly early on was actually everyone wanted to do the right thing, but sometimes people just didn't know what that was. Um, especially when it came to having good conversations, which is why we focused a little bit on on uh, the, the practicalities of what those questions might look like. Because people didn't know they, did, they didn't want to hurt anyone or they didn't want to cause any, you know, further, all sorts of things. So you can imagine kind of what that looks like. So brilliant. Shall I hand over to Freya? Um, and Freya, do you want to do the mentee? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, 